I'm Will Stewart. I'm the founder of Pronk Studios in 90 Central, which is the parent company of Pronk. And this is Zach Taylor. Hello. I'm the director of production, so overseeing a lot of things. We shoot light and phot photograph. Yeah. Yep. Zach's an incredibly talented um, artist, so grateful to have him. He comes from West Coast via South Carolina. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, glad to have everybody here. So we're gonna be talking about a lot of things about this wall here. And one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of chairs is we would love to have it where it's interactive, where people can put their hands on gear or do whatever they wanna do, whatever you feel comfortable doing. So um, we wanna make it where it's fun and enjoyable for uh, everybody. What we're gonna spend our time doing is spending probably 20 minutes where we're just gonna be talking about what we've learned about an LED wall technology. Um, we installed this in February of last year. So it's been quite the learning curve to just figure out how to use it. Um, it's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> so um, there's just been a, a lot of learning that we've done just to understand how's the wall react to the camera? How's the wall react to the light? You know, what are the do's and don'ts? So we're gonna spend the next 20, 30 minutes just sharing all that. Uh, in the middle of it, um, if you have a question or if there's something that's not clear, please, by all means, ask a question. Um, this isn't meant to be a monologue by the both of us. We'd love to, to talk with you about it. Um, then after that, the rest of it's gonna be hands-on. I'd love to put up some environments back here and then just let you guys play with it. Just figure out how, we, how you would light it, what you wanna do with it. Um, if you need Zach to be a model, he's very good at doing that. He does that all the time for our company. Um, if you want me to be a model, I'm so sorry. You shouldn't do that. Um, and then, yeah, so a couple of things. Uh, if we're going to have some interactive stuff, if anybody just wants to move a light or anything, just make sure you're not doing anything that's you know, beyond your ability to, uh, to handle. So don't pick up anything that's too heavy. Um, please don't bring liquids within 10 feet of the wall. Um, that would make us all sad. Uh, make sure you don't put stands close to the wall because that will also make us sad. And then slow is fast. So always be slow as you're moving around uh, on set. All right, so uh, that's what we're gonna do. The first thing we wanna talk about though is just a little trivia. So uh, as a thank you to everybody for coming, we have uh, four t-shirts that we're gonna give out. And this might not be your size. If it's not your size, we have other sizes and Lindsay can swap them out for you. Um, so again, look for Lindsay. She's somewhere, She's, she, she goes all over the place. All right, here's some trivia. First person who knows the answer, tell me. What does uh, the term MOS stand for? Oh man, who was the first person? Okay, Eric, all right. Okay, so, um, and what's that from? Uh, let's talk about the technology of the LED wall. So it's 40 feet, ours is 40 feet wide, 15 feet tall. It's 2.8 millimeter pixel pitch, which basically means if you get close to the wall, and I highly encourage you to get close to the wall, um, the pixels, the distance between the pixels are 2.8 millimeters. So um, that just means that, you know, it's, it's, it's like, um, you know, if you go to a, like a, a, a stadium, you know, the, the LED walls or the, the, the pixels are farther apart because um, you don't have to be that close. Obviously, you're, if you're further away, you're, you're by, you're, your eyes don't need that resolution. Get closer, you can see it a lot sharper. So um, with a camera, it's, it's very forgiving. It depends on, you don't want to, you start getting more A. If you get too close, if, you're, if your focus is, is off, you get more A, and there starts to be some issues with that. So we um, will probably play with that a little bit just mm -hmm. to show people what that looks like because um, you, know, you, you kind of want your talent to be maybe 10 feet off the wall. Um, and it kind of depends on where the, where the camera is, what the focal length is, what you know, the focal plane is, all of those kind of things. So they all kind of like play together and you just kind of play it by ear. You always kind of, before you film, you want to um, uh, have someone looking at the monitor just really pixel peeping for more um, because nothing will blow a shot more than that. What is more Moray is the weird pattern that happens when the camera is um, focusing on a fine pattern. So if you've ever seen uh, photography or video of someone wearing a, a shirt with a super fine pattern, like lines, and it just has this weird kind of like jittery thing. That's more like a. Screen door effect kind of thing, yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and can kind of see it. So I just focused on the wall. Yeah. Okay. So you see why we don't do that. Isn't that sad? <laughs> kind of looks bad. Yeah. So they get to use weird patterns. If you go to the side, it's going to also give you some weird stuff happening. So um, yeah. That's more right. Can we, um, mm, actually, let me, let's, let me see. Let me talk about this a little bit. Um, so there's a lot of, lots of different things you can shoot on the wall. Check out my, my notes. We have some examples here. So like that, for instance, is a flat plate background. That's a flat plate, plate background. And these are not, you know, this is all shot in front of the wall. You know, this, this is just a, a photo. 
Um, that's a photo, that's a photo. That is a 3D uh, environment made in Unreal Engine. Um, that is a image generated by AI. And I have a really funny story about that image. But um, client loved it, so we went with it. That's a 3D environment, just a, a world. The, in, in that sh former shot, the, um, the ladder was real, but everything else wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. that, that was in the background. So, um, and then that's an actual 3D environment where we just have a camera that's just flying and looping uh, around. So there's lots of different things you can do. You can do a 3D environment, you can do a 2D environment, and you can get away with a lot of different things. That's a 3D environment. C client needed a kind of a custom factory. Um, that's a, this is a plate where we just went to their factory and just filmed um, a plate. That's a plate as well. Uh, so there's just a mix. You can do talking heads, you can do product videos, you know, all sorts of things with it. Um, so let's go to the 3D environment, maybe. Sure. Mm -hmm. You want to yeah. hop over to that? Mm -hmm. So we're going to show you what a 3D environment looks like. And essentially what it is, is Unreal is a, um, a gaming engine and you can make uh, 3D worlds, you can make whatever world you want. Um, they use it for uh, any kind of like games, I mean like, my goodness, any kind of first person shooter games, um, a lot of different things. It's kind of become the popular uh, setup. So when The Mandalorian, that's what made it popular, they figured out how to mix both motion capture with the camera, a physical camera with the gaming system. And so what we have is these 12 OptiTrack cameras that are around here, these blue rings, and they're focused on this right here. So if you've ever seen someone in a, in a mocap suit, in one of those like black suits that are skin tight that have like the dots on it, like the ping pong balls, that's simply what this essentially is. So it's, it's emitting an IR signal, uh, infrared signal, and it's catching that and it knows based on these, all these um, you know, points where it is pointing at all times, where it is in space and all that. So as we move the camera here, what it's doing is it's moving the camera virtually in the Unreal set. So there's a camera in the Unreal set that's then projecting this image uh, onto here. And the cool thing is, if you look at the LED wall uh, and you see this, you're, you're like, oh man, that's just weird. You know, like the, the background's moving, it's twisting, you know, it just looks odd. But then when you look at it on a monitor, it looks exactly how it's supposed to. So I'm gonna stand in just so you guys have something beautiful to look at. Um, but you can easily get your lights just, just so and then have, have someone look like you know, they're, they're in a scene. And this is, lights aren't dialed in, I don't, I don't know, I can't really see it, but yeah. we kind of roughed it in. A little loosely. Um, but this gives you a sense. So what we can do is um, in our bigger productions, we can create a custom 3D world or we can uh, kit bash some kind of world where you put some different things together um, and then make some kind of environment. And the cool thing is, you know, if I wanted this environment, I'd have to find this location. <laughs> You know, um, it'd probably be in the summer, right? Because if, I, if it's a school, um, that they wouldn't let me in uh, and just film uh, willy-nilly. So um, if it's an empty school, then I have to, to prop it out. Um, the day before, I'm, you know, there's a bunch of smelly gaffers and grips that are out here, um, you know, putting up some lights and making sure that everything's there. But with this, you can literally put the sun exactly where you want, um, and it gives you complete control of your environment. So you can change colors, you can change, you can move things around. If, if, if I'm like, the color of the wall does not please me, you know, like it literally can be changed. So um, it gives you incredible power, and it's, as, as a director, it's, it spoils you a lot. So it's really, it's really bad. Um, and it makes it faster, because you can, you can do smaller crews instead of having you know, 15, 20 people to outfit and, and get this thing. You know, I'm having a few people that are uh, creating the key props that are in the, in the studio. And then, um, you know, a few people to, to you know, bring the lights and then you can, you kind of have a, can keep a small crew. Um, no rain delays, all that sort of thing. So that's kind of the advantages of this. And this is a, a more of a high-end uh, use of the wall because um, with everybody that you have um, that's filming on the wall, you also have uh, a crew that's there in the brain bar in the back. So we have three computers like back there, and we'd have three people. There's a, a coordinator that's looking at everything. There's someone that's, that's looking at the environment, and then there's someone that's uh, checking OptiTrack and making sure that all tracks well and there's not any glitches. So um, essentially what this kind of shooting does is it takes a lot of the, um, the work that you would do in post where you're compositing with green screen and it puts it more in the pre-production. So instead of creating that world and, and inserting it in the end, you're more working on it in the beginning and then creating and crafting your world around it. But as someone who's worked with both you know, LED walls now and, and green screen, I much rather light uh, based off of what I see with my eyes than, than, you know, I've done the whole thing where you like, you hold it, you got, the, you got your iPad with the picture and then you're like, okay, I think this works and like, I hope it works. And then 
uh, you put it together and it doesn't quite work, and then you, you do some magic in DaVinci Resolve, and, and there you go. So, um, so that's what a 3D environment does. Uh, should we work on, let's talk about the flat environment real quick. So a flat environment is essentially um, a plate. So like a, a, a photo or some kind of video that just sits flat on the environment. Um, the great thing about that is uh, it's a lot faster, cheaper, easier to do. We, we've created environments in AI a lot of times where we'll say like, do this. And I mean, we had a client that's like, put me on a spaceship with this sort of thing. And, and they did it. And, uh, we zoomed in so much you wouldn't even know they're on a, on a spaceship. So you can do just any kind of like environment, um, like, okay, here's a, okay, here's a library. Or you can get stock imagery. So this might be a stock image um, where, oh, there we are, now we're in space. Um, so you can do kind of anything, and it's, it's really cool. So when you have talking heads, any kind of documentary type shoot, anything, anything you're needing, um, just a kind of a simple background, something that looks pleasant, you don't have to kind of be stuck with some plain, locations, you can just set something up and throw it in there and you're good. Um, that's the positives to it. The negatives to it are you cannot move the camera um, like you can with Unreal Engine. So uh, when you have a 3D environment, you have the foreground, the background objects moving, obviously, uh, and synchronizing with your camera. But with a 2D environment, um, when you start moving the camera, it starts feeling uh, kind of funky and weird. Uh, Rhodes, do you want to just like move the camera just so they can see? You have to take off the number two. Oh yeah. Why is it called number two? Because it's two inches? Yeah, right. Get on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I got you one. It fits. But you can see like it just like that does not feel right. You know, there's just something that just feels off. It feels like, you know, a cruise ship. So um, so that's the thing you have to do. You have to uh, make sure that your camera kind of stays still. You can get, shoot with two cameras uh, in this type of environment. So if you have the, you have it wide enough. You know, we've we've used AI to just extend sets. You know, and it's crazy what you can do now. But um, you know, you can you can do two cameras. That works fine. Um, with the 3D environment, you can't do two cameras. You can only do one um, because of a lot of reasons. But basically, the where it's pointing and where it's adjusting and doing all the settings, it can't like do it for two cameras. Uh, Zach, what's the other, there's a one more reason, one more thing you can and cannot do. Um, oh, uh, with 2D environments, with these flat environments, um, it's great for product shots. So you can move your camera if you had something like, you know, really tight on a solo cup or something. Um, that works out well. But if you have a person, you know, you can't move it. Have I missed anything? I don't think so. Sweet. I mean, it's good for commercial purposes because we can go to factories and shoot like a 10 minute plate yeah. of just a factory and we don't have to shut down production or anything like that. And then we can go in here and play that 10 minute clip on loop and interview all their CEOs and you don't hear a factory in the background. You don't have, you know, a lot of those distractions to, to deal with and they don't have to shut down for a day. Yep. Um, same thing with the car dealership stuff. We go in and I just took my little pocket Fuji cam, took some pictures and then we've used those same images for like six different videos now. It's crazy. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of utility commercially wise with the, the flat. Like that's been like the bread and butter for most of it. Yeah. We've done more flat than, I've, than I expected. Um, got that we do a lot of 3D stuff, but the, the amount of work that it takes, the cost, I mean, just, there's just like, it's just only for the, like the bigger stuff, but a lot of 2D stuff, even when we're doing, I mean, we did a case study for a construction company and we went on site, did all the, the you know, shots that we needed to get for that, got all the B-roll, and then just came back. We filmed plates and just kind of had the, the camera on a tripod. Did you, did you just do a photo or did you, did you have it run, have the video running? Which for Lawrence, Lawrence County. Lawrence County. Um, we did, yeah, so that had water moving, so we did a video. Okay. Because so it was a like, water treatment plant, so I just had a 10-minute video because the wind was kind of moving. Nice. That's one thing. If you're outside, it's hard to light outside scenes. It's hard oh. to mimic sunlight in here. Um, it's also, if you have anything in the background that should be moving, like a flag or a tree, it's kind of hard to do flat images yep. if you're doing video in front of that. Um, so yeah, sometimes we'll just kind of put up a video on a tripod and mark your focal length. And especially if you're on site, you can have, you know, a second person stand in for you. And then we'll take that image with the stand in, put it here, and then basically frame that person up to completely block the picture of themselves. And then when you interview someone, it's like perfectly sized for yeah. the interview. It works perfect. Works so good. Yeah, so we found like doing that B-roll and then doing all the interviews somewhere else just makes it so much faster for us. So if we're already doing a two-day shoot, instead of just like lugging lights and everything, 
we go with a small crew, you know, we don't, we're not carrying a bunch of lights and our backs thank us. So it works out good. We did a four day shoot in Fayetteville and we were just standing in the sun shooting <laughs> one, one scene for a 30 minute, it was like an hour long to 30 minute uh, instructional video that they wanted to do in English and Spanish. And it took a full eight hour day to do, eight hour day to do English and a full eight hour to do Spanish. And the whole time we were just moving this 12 foot silk with the sun all day, balancing the light. And I'm like, I could have just taken a picture. That's yep. all I would have had to do. We could be in the and We would have paid them to come here. Yeah. <laughs> Not sweat. Dude. Have y'all ever done the whole like chase the sun with the, with the 12 by thing? It's, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite things to do. We had a shoot, we had a shoot with uh, John Deere and it was crazy because it was this, you know, interstate that turns to a highway that turns into a two lane road that then turns into a dirt road. And it's one of those shoots where, you know, the, the call time is something super, super early and um, is down near Augusta. And so, you know, I, I like by 6 a.m. I'm there and I don't know where I am really. I'm just been following the GPS. And then I meet this old farmer and he has like this truck and we follow the farmer in the truck and then go down this like pecan orchard or peach orchard or I don't even know what it was, you know. Um, and finally, it feels like forever, there's no road. We're just going through trees and finally we're there and there's this big John Deere tractor. And I'm like, okay, great. And it's this talking head where someone's standing in front of a John Deere tractor and talking. And so we set up our first shot um, and uh, got everything ready to go. You know, slates in, we roll, and we hear an airplane. <laughs> and so like, we just stop. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, and so, like, we, so we wait for the airplane to go. And it's just this like, fancy you know, private jet. And I was like, okay, that's, that's cool, great. I'm in the middle of nowhere, but a, a private jet shot, messed up my shot. So we start again, slate in, start rolling again. Here comes another jet. And we, it was right at the Masters, and as the Masters was about to start, and all these, we were in the, the, the line of all the private jets that were coming in for, the, for Augusta, and that was just a blast. So this kind of stuff helps, it fixes all that, and... For me, it's the crow. Oh, yeah, the crow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, or the, or the South Carolina Carolinian that doesn't have a muffler on their car. Mm. Yeah. You can change exposure, yeah. So... Right now we're at 20% or so. I don't know exactly where we are, but. 300 nits. And it goes to what, two, like 2,500 or something. I can't do public math. So yeah. yeah, we're at. Very low. Really, yeah, we're low. So yeah, you can. If, so if, if um, times we've, we've increased it, if we're like needing a bunch of light cause I'm pumping in and we need to kind of overpower or something, we've done that. Um, if we need a, a strong backlight coming in, we've, we've done that, so yeah. So he asked if we can change the lighting on the screen. I'm saying this because there's people that are recording video and Rhodes told me that I have to repeat the question. Um, so, uh, so yes and no. So when it comes to a 3D environment, yes. You can move the sun around, you can set it to like golden hour, you can do just anything you, your heart desires and get that sun hitting exactly how you want. You can move a tree so the dapple you know, the, of the tree is perfect. You can change the speed of the wind so the dapple is like moving exactly how you want it. It's very godlike. With this, you're basically limited to the, to the power of Photoshop. So, you know, essentially what Photoshop can do, you can do here. So, um, if you're really good at Photoshop, then, I, uh, you know, you could. Yeah. With power of AI, you could, like, just, I'm, I'm sure there's like, make the light on the other side. Any other questions? Uh, I've got yeah. Kind of a yes. So, there's a technology that they're working on that will um, do that. Um, KinoFlow has... Special bulbs that kind of do, th do that now. Um, somebody else, another brand, I forget their name, um, has that. Oh, he, oh for, the, for our fine viewers at home, he asked, uh, can the light change color temperature with the wall? Um, uh, there's like some plugins that they're kind of working to kind of like do a kind of a, like autom almost like an automated DMX type deal. Um, but there's nothing, there's nothing like with these lights or like it's got to be pretty special light um, to be able to do that. Awesome. Okay, that, that may be the brand I was, I was thinking about. Um, yeah, that's good. Yeah, there's so much. There's so much that are, like, is happening around like um, dynamic lights, yeah. and um, you know, like Aperture did it with their Infinibars, where it used to be that you know maybe there's like a section, and then a section, and a section where you could like cordon off, and you have like different colors. Now, like every pixel on ours, like you can do like chasing and like kind of like really interesting things. And yeah, I can't wait to see where the technology goes with that. Any other questions before we keep? I, I have yeah. one more question, sorry. Um, oh, yeah, it's a two-parter. <laughs> no worries. You probably have an answer. I mean, I have an answer. Do you have an answer? 
Uh, we, we shot someone. He asked I, the craziest it, thing you pulled off on the LED wall. The craziest Bingo. thing. I took a picture. I yeah. took a picture in a car dealership, and we made it look like he was there. It was wild. <laughs> <laughs> wow, dude, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so Honeywell came to us just recently, and they had um, PPE that they wanted to film that was their product, and um, it was for firefighters. And so we had, like, firefighters here in full gear, and then, you know, flames and all that sort of thing going, and, you know, we were able to do that. Um, a there was a, uh, Fred Armisen came in for a music video, and they had um, they had him on like a turntable. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. yeah so they had him on a turntable, and he and another actor were spinning while the world was spinning the opposite way, and it's just like making this crazy effect. That was cool. We did the cinema robot stuff too. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, that was. We fun. did a time lapse thing where we had the the wall basically render out the 3D environment a full day and set that to like 10 minutes yeah. and then had people walk around the scene for 10 minutes and then sped the whole thing up to make it look like a, an entire day time lapse yeah, that we shot cool. in 10 minutes. We shot a whole day time lapse. Yeah. yeah. The living room scene. So literally like there's a, there's a, um, a thing of food on a, on a, um, coffee table mm -hmm. and the cinema robots just slowly just moving you know, and it has this move that's just basically like this to this, you know, but it, well, we set it for 10 minutes. And so it's just doing this. It's just like slowly going. And then um, the world in the background is moving where the sun comes to your question, like moving the light around. So the sun was moving from like, say, I think we, I think we had like two or three o'clock mm -hmm. to eight or nine o'clock. So it went from, you know, bright afternoon sun to the kind of like that, that twilight to um, dark. And then as it was in, and that was over a 10 minute period. And then we had people just kind of walking in and out of the scene, grabbing things from the, from the dip and just walking in, being hanging out and walking out. And it, it sold it. I mean, like yeah. it, it was pretty cool how they kind of whizzed in and out. We, we did this whole like mapping where we had certain people sitting in certain places and standing up and. Um, I like lighting cues too. Yeah. At like halfway through, we switched to tungsten and then. Yeah. And then we, we had like a practical light that turned on, but then we had a light in the Unreal Engine wall that, that turned on so it reflected the light onto the virtual set. It was nuts. It was it was a blast. Turned out exactly how I wanted it to. There's also the, um, what do we do with the lantern? Uh, we didn't end up doing it, but you could have taken the puck and put it on the bottom of the lantern and yeah. the, basically map a light source to it so that as you walk through the forest, the light from the lantern, practical, yeah. is showing in the environment itself. Yeah. Does that make sense, what are you saying? Yeah. yeah. Like, it's, it's nuts, because you can take, basically, it's, it's, it's like that, but it's like a smaller, smaller one. It has, like, four dots on it, and you can attach it to anything. So you have, like, a flashlight. You could shine your flashlight onto the scene, and, and, the, and the world gets illuminated in there. It's just crazy. Hey, it's trippy. I have a question here. Yes, sir. So, did you do this? Yeah, so it was all LED wall. So um, what we did was, so he's, he's asking, um, we have a shot where there's a kid driving a car, and um, we're legally required to say that we filmed that in front of here, not on the street somewhere. Mm -hmm. now, but uh, I was hoping that we'd get angry calls from somebody, and we never did, and I'm just so disappointed. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially what we did was, um, and he was asking how do we do reflections on the glass. So we put the car about right here, um, where it's pointing toward this. And um, the rule is you can't point toward the wall with your camera but there's no rule that says you can't point away from it and have the reflection. So something could be very close to it. Um, and the fidelity of the reflection is still, is not gonna be compromised by being super close to the wall. So we just literally had the, I mean, it's probably about right here. And we allowed this to, to come in. And then we did a kind of interesting trick. Um, instead of having this hard edge where the, the lights were, were shining and then they weren't shining anymore, we put a black uh, strip of, uh, that was feathered that went from you know pure black all the way to you know the purely showing the image, and that was probably three feet or so. And it was kind of interesting because when you shot it, you would like your eye would just kind of like forget that the the world was there, and it would just like, it would pull pull your eye until your eye just kind of like when you saw the black, you just thought that that was just you know supposed to be there. So it worked out perfectly. And that was just like a gradient mask in Premiere, right? Like just drop it down from the top so that there's not like a hard edge. Oh, uh, No, we, we actually did it oh, did. practically on the wall. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we were playing the video in Premiere onto the wall. Oh, so we were using Premiere to project it. Yeah. And then we put that, that mask on there. And it worked out great. So it was 100% practical. There's no. We also no had um, the rear view mirror. We, not the rear view, what's the side mirror, basically? Yeah. We just tilted it 
as far out as it could go until it <laughs> caught that reflection again. Yep. And so that way you saw like the driving by on that side yep. in the rear view mirror. But yeah, it's also just kind of careful angles, some tight shots, you can't get too wide without breaking it. You're super limited when it comes to cars, yeah. uh, especially on a wall this size. If you want, if you really want to film a, a car without any um, limitations, you need 180 degrees, you need a, a ceiling that can come down and independently has panels that come down to certain places. There's so many angles. Yes, sir. As far as what you were doing, was right, you were there a separate panel that reflected onto the front. Yeah, no, it was just literally that, that side of it. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> so in that video when you are talking about the car, did you do, um, was, it, was it unreal um, environment or was it mainly just like an image that was blurred and moving fast? Yeah. As far as the background. So he was asking what the background was, dear viewer. Um, so it was um, plates that we filmed with a GoPro, I think, uh, in Greenville. I stuck a GoPro to my window and drove around Greenville. <laughs> just, <laughs> and then I just sipping on a juice box. Just sipping, and yeah, and we just put that on the wall. And then, since it was there, I kind of knew the exact height our camera needed to be to match that angle. Yeah. And yeah, just messed with zoom to kind of get perspective and. Yeah, with, with video, GoPro was fine because, you know, you're not focused on a single image. So, you know, it's not the highest quality video, no. but you would never notice because everything's moving. Yeah. It's out of focus in the background. Yeah. And then, yeah, and we had the uh, softbox too with like the lighting. It's like almost like the paparazzi flash yep. effect, just kind of slowed down and had that as like a hard hit, just as like, you know, sun reflecting off the the buildings as he was driving. Yeah, so we had, um, we had a four by reflector that had two Fresnels pointed at it. Um, I think there's six, both 600 Ds. One mm -hmm. 600 D stayed constant. Um, and then one blinked, mm -hmm. almost like faulty bulb type thing. Just like, and, and so it would give that feeling of dapple just kind of coming in. Um, you have to do that if you're shooting any kind of car stuff. The, the lighting never stays the same. So it's always just changing colors and changing, just, it's just getting funky. So um, you have to get funky with it. That takes me to my next point, Rhodes. You're a great wingman. All right, so the issue where if you ever see an LED wall and you're like, oh, I can tell that's an LED wall, I guarantee you it's because your blacks are milky. So a milky black is where the blacks aren't at, you know, if you have zero to 100 on, on your IRE scale, 100 being completely white, zero being completely black. If your blacks are like at 10 or something like that and they're not hitting zero or near zero, um, then you have like this washed out black. And so what happens uh, with that is when you have light that's just spilling onto the, the background, um, especially if you have um, your walls not like pump, pumping up like, like this one is, you can see like there's just all the stuff that's hitting it. So, um, you know, right now we have our, our topper that's just not very, uh, still high. And you can just see like all this light is just coming onto this, this wall. So if you're having um, light directly hit the wall, it's going to start fading out the blacks. It's not going to affect the brights as much or mids. It's just not, but um, any, kind of, any kind of blacks will be um, affected. So that's the number one rule. You have to really make sure that you're not um, hitting light directly onto the wall. And so it's a little limitation, but it's, it's, it's easily workaroundable, or you can work around it easily. Mm -hmm. um, a good thing, good practice to do is literally what Zach just did, which was turn up the wall. So if you're ever in a situation where you're lighting, you know, you're like, man, I got this perfect, this is looking so good, turn off the wall, and then look at it. And then you might change your mind on how well you did, um, and go find, find a, a negative. It also depends on the environment, too. It's a lot more forgiving in a bright environment like this. Yep. Um, you know, it just depends on how many shadows you actually have in your environment. Some images just don't have pure black anyway. Yep. Um, so those would be a little more uh, a little more flexible. But then with the uh, firefighter stuff, there was a lot of night scenes. So it was like everything was off and you could only use really controlled light sources. So yep. everything like this had to have a grid on it. So, you know, that's just controlling your light spill from going everywhere. That's a, I think, 35 degree grid. So that basically you're not getting any light at this angle here and you can kind of use that to control and there's grids for pretty much every light you have yeah. barn doors on that so that's the reason i have this flag here because otherwise this light just smacks the wall lifts the shadows um just lovely yeah so it's just kind of a lighting control that's the name of the game for for making things look realistic and 
Yeah, I don't know. Do you want to talk about lighting environments? Yeah, so um, when you approach an environment, um, the first thing you have to think about is the world that the environment exists in, not just the scene that you're lighting. Um, because when you go into, um, in real life, if I went into a living room, like my environment's my environment, you know, and what I'm probably going to be doing is I'm drawing blinds, I'm putting negative up, I'm, you know, uh, doing some kind of, you know, some kind of tent on the windows or doing the ND or something. Um, but when you're in a space like this, I mean, this, this room is, is wrapped in, you know, neg. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, it's a big black box. And um, it's a great advantage because you don't want light to bounce where it's not supposed to bounce, but it's a great disadvantage because if you're just like, oh man, I can just throw up a key and I'm good. Um, no, you start getting like weird stuff that kind of, it just looks unnatural to your eye. And your eye goes, man, there's just something kind of off with that. So um, it's important to, before you even start lighting your scene, to first light your world and think about, look at the world and go like, okay, what's, what does this world look like? Do you wanna to go to like the 3D world and let's just like do that real quick? Sure. Would that work? Mm -hmm. um, and just like, once you see um, what the world looks like, then you can start like going, okay, all right. So like, it's just, it is interesting because you have to think about, okay, what's reflecting from the floor, you know? And what's, what's on the walls? And, and you know, do I have like a, do a big soft source that's coming in, then, a, then more of a, a pinpoint type source that's, that's coming in. You just have to think about all that kind of stuff. So um, like for this, if I'm, if I'm looking at this, um, you know, I'm looking at the, the ceiling. The ceiling is some kind of a green color. I don't know, it's, it's you know, this is kind of what it is. So, so I'm trying to think of like, all right, do we, we want to move, change these lights a little bit to match that. Um, I'm looking at the windows and I'm going, okay, we have uh, our main light sources coming from the left. So if I want to kind of, you know, use, use what the, the room's already giving me, um, I'm going to light from the left, you know, like kind of you'd normally do if you were in a, um, in a kind of situation. I'm looking at, you know, how much contrast is, is here, you know, is there any kind of up light that's being hit? So um, you can see that like there's this light that's, that's here that's pooling here and then coming up. So like, do I need to you know, do some kind of uplight. I've never, ever used, you know, uplight until I started doing it with an LED wall. And then I've started like, you know, I'll put, uh, you know, ultra bounce and just like lay it on the floor. I'll put, you know, lights and just have them kind of like bounce. And just, it's just little hits that just help lift things up. Otherwise it just starts looking super contrasty. So like, if you look at me right now, um, I'm super contrasty. And so like, I mean, this might look good if you were doing something that just, you want to be super stylized. But if I were going to emulate this in, in real world, you bet there's like a black floppy right here. I mean, like just right out of flame, frame as, as much as you can be. And it doesn't feel very natural. So if you want it to feel natural, then you have to start feeding the world. You want to change the uh, ceiling? Just did. Yeah. So cool. got 0.2 green and I set it to 4,800 because it looks a little bit warmer than daylight. Yeah. Um, we have that light coming here. So I kind of look at the intensity of the light in the scene. So I see right now we have, well, intensity, direction, and color, I guess, would be the main thing. So we have a hard light source coming in from camera left. Um, so I have a light over there that's set at 4,800, just a little bit warmer than daylight. Um, that one, I think, is up to like 5,000, kind of feather us into, because we're using a daylight white balance. Uh, every now and then, I'll light the scene with like a I'll kind of use that eight by and maybe bring in a little bit more warmth and a little bit more green from this side yeah. and just kind of wrap that um, what would be bouncing off of this wall here. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, instead of going into a scene with nothing to start with, you, you have, you just look at your, your scene. You look at the, you know, if it's a 3D environment, you, you can change that lighting or if it's just a, a still image then you know it's it's motivated lighting that you just kind of have to work with yeah um and and i was always taught you know light with one light at a time you know you always just start with one one brush at a time one stroke at a time to get get your lighting exactly how you need to so if you ever get stuck you know it's good to just kind of tur start turning off lights and then just figuring out like what what looks good where's the moment where you're like okay this looks good and like do i have my levels right is this is this light hitting me good well is this the enough kind of that's coming from the top or does that feel like too toppy and just, just dealing with those things, because I, I mean, that feels like super unnatural, you know? Um, and so like, you gotta find that, find that balance. It's like, okay, like this is, this is working. 
my room is, it, it's, what did you say? You gotta kinda make the world gross before you make it beautiful. Yeah, it's kinda, you gotta light it poorly to light it well sometimes. Yeah. So good. Profound it's, words from Zachary Taylor. I get, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, cause you're, you're kind of pretending you have the limitations on that day that you would have. Right. Like if you just, you know, light them absolutely perfectly with this dingy looking background, that's not gonna fit. Yeah. So it really just depends on what you're going for. Yeah. If you have a perfectly lit background, then go for it, you yeah. know? But yeah, it just depends on, it's not always, you're not always going for the best. You're just kind of trying to sell the effect that they're in this environment. So yeah. the, the lights you see in the environment need to be interacting with your subject. For that firefighter thing, we had a lot of pictures with fire in the background. So we had a lot of, you know, just orange, blasts coming in from those novas we had one with uh, like a police car in the background so we had a hard red and blue edge on one side so you know it's not always you're not doing it beautifully sometimes you're doing it realistically yeah well said sir yes rose all right yeah. can you and how would you shoot full frame head to toe scenes with this wall great question so he asked, how do you film uh, head to toe scenes, show the floor and then max it, mi uh, mix it with the LED wall? Very carefully. <laughs> so um, the, the technology does not exist quite where you can you know, make an LED floor that just really looks good. Like they just, they've, they've done it, it, but it's more of a gimmick. And it's hard to, to, to hide that, um, that edge. So the, the name of the game when it comes to filming an LED wall is props. If, you're, if you have good props, and you have an environment that has things that are, you know, in front of the actors, so they're not just looking, um, like they're just kind of like standing there, and then things that are scattered here, that helps so much. So, like for instance, the living room scene, we had, that was completely, you know, floor to ceiling. Um, so we had a rug, and then we had chairs that were positioned. And basically what you're trying to do is you're basically trying to cover that line. If you can cover that line, then you're good. So little pieces of furniture, and all that just kind of makes it work. Um, there's this really great spot that Chevy did. Uh, I, I want to have that, that one just like available to ever show people. It's pretty cool. So what they did was uh, Chevy was, it's their cars that are uh, um, uh, like parked on this, on this concrete pad, but then they have like a little like concrete riser that kind of goes, goes around and you can tell that they're covering the, the line, but how they did it and how they designed it made it look like that was just kind of, kind of something natural there. So. Um, you just have to cover that line and then it's very limiting. Yes, it is limiting. So you, yeah, and you probably cannot shoot exterior scenes. So scenes. yes, great question. So um, he's asked about ex shooting exterior scenes. You can do many of them. The one that's super difficult. And I think this isn't just an LED thing. It's just an interior thing is uh, direct sunlight, you know, coming right at you. So if you have any kind of like direct sunlight shot, um, it's super hard, especially if someone's moving because they're relative to the sun. As soon as they move, I mean, they're moving in a way that's unnatural. So um, yeah, direct sunlight is good. If you have a scene where it's diffused, then you can do that all day long. But head to toe though. Yeah, you can, you just bring in, you bring in grass, you bring in sand. Um, okay. So yeah, so a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and then like someone shot a, a, a pool scene here. So um, it was grass and then it was what looked like the pool. Yeah, it was a stage that kind of came up. So. Um, and then there's you know props all around it, and, and then kind of like does it, and it works out well. I was gonna say it's kind of like what they did with the old TV shows or old movies. They would have something in front, and yeah, in, in, in essence protect from behind. Yeah, this is a, this is rear projection. It's just different. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like like King Kong was rear projection, right? In a lot of a lot of cases. Yeah. But you could tell. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, so like there's a movie that wants to film here and um, they asked us, they gave us the script and said, you know, how much can we film in this location? And it's like 85% they could film here, but a lot of the stuff, like the exteriors, they can't film, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, that's where you kind of get, get limited for sure. Yeah. yeah, great. Yeah, so you can use... Yeah, so she asked about how does it work with moving backgrounds. You want to talk about that? Yeah, if, if there's a video, it's good. My, my main thing was if you are just working with like a still plate. So if there's just a, like someone took an image, right, of a beach and then put and it has, behind you. You have someone in the background going. Yeah, and you have waves that are not moving. That's where it's like, okay, that's not working. But that's where we would go to the beach and film 10 minutes and loop that 
or you know you can film as long as you want but you would put that video behind them and then it'll look great yeah so like to do a beach scene what you would do is you'd almost create a, a little berm so you'd have your sand come in then you'd have a, a little bit of berm that just kind of comes up you put in your grass or whatever and then you have the person sitting there and then that allows you then to put your your world you know behind that and it, it works out great Yes. So if, if you have, if, if, the, if it's a still back there or if, even if it's a video um, and it's just a flat, it's just a flat plate, then yes. Well, if you start, as soon as you start moving, it just starts feeling funky. Some, some of your eyes are like, wait a second. Um, unless you're doing a super close up, you know, shot of something like if you have a beach ball or something, then that you can get away with it like that. Are you able to mix plates and Unreal Engine into the same image? Or just... Can you mix plates and Unreal Image in the same? And then same image. I don't know, Unreal Engine. I like creating an environment based off a of plate. Still photo? Like if you did have a beach, could you just add in Unreal Engine water? Me? Could you add Unreal <laughs> Me? No. <laughs> I mean you someone could, else probably. You could, but I think if you were gonna add water to a still image, that's gotta be your great still image. Like that's gotta be like the greatest still image in the world because I would just be like, since I'm here, you know, I'll make the beach and the and the you know, everything else. I would just look for a video. <laughs> What's the call? Like, what do you guys need? Do you need more people to learn Unreal? Or is that kind of a, a hard place to find people? Yeah. So right now there's a big, so you asked, uh, what do we need uh, as a company uh, or looking for? Yeah, people that know how to run Unreal Engine, LD wall technology, techs, you know, just understanding the, the beast. Uh, Zach calls it the dinosaur. Um, Zach's really good with analogies, guys. Um, he says, I feel like I'm a zookeeper, and uh, this is a dinosaur. And he's like, I understand like, how animals work, but it's a dinosaur. And you know, dinosaurs kind of work a little different than, than other animals. And so, like, that's, so you have to be understand how, you know, how to do the uh, Chris Pratt and tame the dinosaur. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the big, I mean, that's the skill that um, people are uh, flocking to, to schools to, to learn right now, and it's, it's in high, high demand. I think with AI and everything else that's coming out, like there's going to be more and more like virtual things. Mm -hmm. so. Do you think this will become like a regular wheelhouse tool in, in people's toolkit to know how to do or at least work with? This will become a regular tool house, uh, a tool kit um, for people. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think it's, it's, it's only going to get cheaper. It's going to get easier. I mean, like it's just going to get simpler, you know. Um, I mean, this technology is only what, six, seven years old, really? I mean, like, it's, it's the principle you know, is, is not old, but, um, you know, the main learning just recently did it, and then, and, and then you know, like, there's so much that, that goes into this where it's, it's a lot of pieces that aren't supposed to talk to, to each other that are, are made to talk to each other. And so there's not really a, a great one, all-in-one toolkit where it's just like, hey, pay us, you know, this, much, this many bucks and we'll, we'll install it, and it all works perfectly. So um, as things start progressing, it's going to get better, for sure. A lot of clients are... Uh... I don't want to say uh, lazy, but if they can do something indoors with air conditioning, <laughs> then they probably will. Yeah. Uh, so I think if this is probably something that if you ignore it, you'll probably start losing jobs if you don't kind of know how to do it or at least work around it. So, you know, if you're a grip or a gaffer, knowing just the key things coming into a scene like this and knowing kind of your foundation, you can take your you know, your lighting basics and work off that. You just know, okay, I need to control the light more and not spill it on the wall. I need to use this environment to motivate what I'm using as my light sources, the colors and how hard they're hitting, yeah. you know? And then it's just kind of like you, your lighting fundamentals go from there. It's just kind of adapting to the technology. Yeah, and the, the DP that taught me took, would take literally every light off the truck. I mean, just every light. Um, gaffers hate them. And, um, I, I, my sensibilities, I was never that kind of person. I'm like a three light guy, you know, and it's, I, I just always just kind of, I like it simple and like just working with some simple things. But with LED walls, the more lights you have, the better. And it's not about volume. It's not about brightness. It's more about having different colors and, and hits and different things. So like we have, you know, we have these Infinibars and we have these MC lights. Um, so, and these things are your friend. Like having these kind of lights that can just, you know, give a splash of color or do whatever you can, I mean, they're, they're programmable to, to do, you know, kind of whatever you want it to do, um, really helps because 
you know, the amount of, of weird, funky kind of like hits that you need sometimes for something and just like something just weird in the environment that's hitting, hitting in an odd way. Um, it's not going to naturally happen unless you kind of produce it. So having these kind of lights, you know, if I was a DP and someone's like, hey, I need you to light an LED wall, um, you know, you bring your typical like, you know, light of volume, light of, you know, get your key lights and all that stuff, and then bring in some specialty kind of RGB type lights uh, like this uh, and fin bars that are over there um, because they really help and they come in a pinch. And like those are the details too. Like this scene without it, I mean, you notice all the desks in the background are just like overexposed, like getting hit with that light. So being able to just take something like this and splash it on that desk, it's gonna make that desk line up more with the ones in the background. Yep. And then you're starting to see that effect more. And that's just one light. And we'll use, I mean, we'll use 10 lights on a scene and you'll, you'll not know it, but it's just like, it's, it's, it's all these little pops. They're just kind of everywhere in different colors and different hits. So um, it works. I know time's of the essence. What's, what's, the, what's the go leaving time? What's the, what's the, what do you? Is it 11.45 or 11? <laughs> Okay.